Oh, hey everyone, this is the HEAL project, the team from the HEAL project, Ignacio, Rida, and Redby, and we are here to do our third Skillshare. So I'm going to start today, and what I decided to do was <laughs> workplace friendship. Uh, I wanted to talk about workplace friendship uh, because for a lot of reasons. I mean, because we... Um, we have a small group of us together. We interact a lot and we uh, I can say that we like each other, right? <laughs> we get along very, very well. But I was thinking more um, deeply and intensely about workplace friendship. So I'm gonna share my screen and workplace friendship. Okay, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely people. <laughs> The people that I work with and I care for and I'm getting to know more. Uh, but in thinking about like workplace friendship and everything that I looked up, it was interesting what I found, what they talked about it. Right. So to me, this is all about relationships and relationship building. Um, so a lot of the things that I looked up on workshop workplace friendships really was about either the pros of it being a good thing in terms of it helps to increase work productivity, it helps you to you know be better at work, which I think is fine in, in and of itself, but uh, it kind of just rested there. The, the cons are mostly around like um, don't share too much of yourself, you know, be very private, right? Because I think it's in a much bigger environment, uh, more people. Right? So what, what does it look like if you're in a different kind of environment and uh, we want to be um, sharing more or, or relationship building because it's the work that we do. So um, oh, I just said this, right? So the relationship building, you know, for not the way that we want to do it is like we're not for profit versus the grassroots not-for-profit grassroots versus capitalism, right? In the ways that they, um, um, I think, think about friendship or workplace um, connections. And it's not about productivity, uh, but wellness, care, validation, witnessing uh, one another. But, um, but I think it's also about the build, uh, to build sustainable relationships. Um, we have to like earn or, or you know, get to the place where we can trust each other, understand account accountability, respect communication and boundaries. So truth bomb, I am totally nervous that I will cross somebody's boundary. I think about that all the time. And so that's uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to definitely talk about this because when we think, when, when we're thinking about the work that we do, you know, we talk about survivorship, uh, I'm a survivor, you know, our past experiences with work uh, friendships and the culture, like almost this capitalist culture. Um, I want it to, I want to keep pushing against um, those ways and really move more, um, closer to how we do our work in terms of uh, that relationship building connection and the, and the skills to that is um, very, very important All right. um, to our work and personally. So some of the boundaries that I was thinking, and I like that they put these into four different bound, like different kinds of boundaries, because I get so nervous about them. And they, they broke it up into emotional, time, topic, and physical. So, uh, and they give a little sentence there. So your emotional boundaries, you know, how much time you can give or not give, um, what you're willing to talk about or not talk about, um, and then space, you know, um, kind of like a physical space. So, so I like that. And um, I wanted to, you know, present that to y'all because I think last time I talked to you about having a, a meeting where we can uh, really think about what relationship building looks like for us as the HEAL project, as people doing this work, as people, um, you know, thinking about, you know, anti-capitalist frameworks and, um, yeah, where one um, encourages, you know, extreme privacy, what, what does the other one encourage, right? Uh, and it doesn't really, I think it doesn't really mean you have to tell somebody every bit of your life, but um, there are some more, there's more clarity about how you want to navigate it, right? More intentionality, I think. So some things to consider. Uh, again, time comes up. And I, there's just sentences here that I picked out one from one of the articles that kind of talked about, you know, time, respecting each other's time. You know, if, if someone is saying, I'll be there at a certain time, that's the time you get there, right? Because for someone else, that might be 
a real deal breaker, right? That time is important. So talking about um, what time means to the both of you, what needs um, you have, the ability to express yourself, right? If you can't express yourself, um, that becomes really hard. And it's like, you want to be, let's say, authentic, honest, and healthy. And is the relationship, re you know, reciprocal? Um, so that's also important, right? Because if one person feels like they're basically carrying the relationship or, or um, just being a, a, a sounding board and not really an, um, getting anything in return. So that's a gauge to kind of think about also privacy and confidentiality. Uh, again, this is about, you know, I think that privacy is very important and confidentiality, especially if you're talking about it um, clearly and intentionally, because I think a lot of times we end up, we talk about things and just assume, you know, best intentions. Um, and so uh, it's best to just be clear about these things and like, um, and know how people feel about it. Like what are their thoughts on confidentiality and, and, and all that, right? And so, and then values, we talk about this a lot, the values of us at the HEAL project and, you know, personal values too. Um, and so it's about like respect, but also I think we also have, um, I think we have a lot of similar values. Um, but if there are differences, it's about like knowing those and respecting those. Also looking for like uh, separating your emotions from your wellness. It's, this is about codependency, right? So if you um, if you have if you know we have the support of each other and something happens and you're the only one I can go to, it's like there's this attachment there that might not be healthy, right? Um, so keeping that in mind and how we affect each other's lives. I like this one a lot because it's about like how you, your energy, your flow, you know. Um, I know that every time we get together, we talk, we check in, we talk about, you know, how are we doing? Um, and, you know, we can verbally say that, but we could also feel things, you know, and feel and, 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 and notice the energy that's brought into meetings. And of course, this is a little different because we don't work in the same office, we're virtual, but, you know, we, I think we get a sense of it. Um, and then how we support one another. Um, so what support looks like, what support means to, to each of us. Um, because I think that we got it, I think we have it really well in terms of the HEAL project. Uh, and so I, I think I wanna go a little further uh, into us as individuals um, and knowing those uh, things as well. So when I started doing this, I got into a rabbit hole, of course, because I kept on thinking about, you know, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. So, um, so to me, this work of the relationship building and going deeper um, and supporting one another is about doing anti-capitalist work. It's a, like a anti-business kind of model, right? Um, so we're doing, we're trying to do it differently within the structure or the system of capitalism. Uh, and so uh, I got this quote uh, that I like, if I can get it. Oh, no. Uh, can someone read that, Rita? <laughs> yes, capitalism is bad. Capitalism ignores people's needs, results in wealth inequality, and does not promote equal opportunity. Capitalism also encourages mass consumption, is unsustainable, and provides an incentive for business owners to harm the environment for monetary gain. Capitalism is also ineffective and unstable. I like this. I like this uh, description of capitalism. And when I think about the relationship building piece, it's like, um, it's so, um, uh, uh, to me, the relationship piece is about sustainability. You know, capitalism isn't sustainable. Um, for me, it's also about, um, it's not about monetary gain. It's about something else, something deeper. Um, and, or in my opinion, something deeper, right? Money could be deep for somebody else. But, and, and um, it's also, um, uh, it's also about wellness too, the relationship building uh, wellness. So it goes, it goes uh, uh, beyond and outside of, the actual work we do. And so to me, um, you know, capitalism also contributes to um, how we don't have a, uh, a right relation with the world around us. So I was thinking about relationships a lot. And so I saw this other thing that says, uh, do you expect your government to protect the air you breathe? Yes. 
the water you drink? Yes. The quality of life? Yes. So long, how long have you been anti-business, right? <laughs> so it's like, um, to be in this kind of framework is to um, not think about well-being, personal health, growth, and that it's all connected to, you know, profit and um, the the business. And so um, that's not what we we're about. The anti-business model. So I I, I read this article um, that said um, they were talking about describing this anti-business um, model. So I was like, oh, let's see what this is about. And when I go down to the bottom, the anti-business model is that it is a business of one. <laughs> they said that you work, for, you know, I'm wor working for myself and um, um, the way that has changed interactions with other people, like in competition and all this stuff. So it, that made me laugh when he said a business of one, but I mean, as you see now, many people are doing consulting work and also we're a small, um, you know, organization. And so we constantly talk about um, smaller as being better, smaller things. Um, and so um, that's what made me think about that, that anti-business model. It's like we think about not wanting to grow so big, right? Because we want to, um, we want to be able to stay at a certain length and be sustainable and grow those relationships with one another much more deeply. So um, <clears throat> our work on human connection. So the anti-business model to me that we do is our work on human connection and the skills needed for that for sustainability, our skills building time, our collaboration rubric that we are small, that we work on healing, that profit isn't the goal and being in right relation with the earth. And we talk about um, that whole cycle of like understanding and loving and caring for ourselves and and also um the world around us so i think it's uh totally anti-capitalist right and it's about um sustainable friends so can we be friends <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ignacio. <laughs> um, I really like that. And um, and again, once again, we don't we're not planning this, but I feel like all of our themes and um, presentations are going to work really well together. Um, you know, as you were uh, saying, as you were presenting it, I was detecting these pieces of myself that is so ingrained around you know running a business and having to do that in a capitalistic society with all the things that not only just like the values that I've internalized around how what is the good way of running mm -hmm. a business uh, with the goal of keeping the business alive right yeah. um as well as like adopting these anti-capitalist models of running a business and having this anxiety around but do they work right. but are we going to survive right but right. are we are we strong enough big enough do we have enough money uh do we get enough support to hold on to our values and also just stay to have be in business another day right, <laughs> and, right. and say these things, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so and the, the, the concept of friendship with that, again, that's the same kind of piece of myself that I, I'm detecting having anxieties around feeling like, yeah, like, you know, you're all awesome people that I want to like actually know as people. And I know both of mm -hmm. you as people as well but it's just like thinking about the concept of friend workplace friendship gives me this anxiety around but then how would I go with the business when I have to make business decisions in the mm -hmm. interest of the business and mm -hmm. when they have conflict with the interest of my friends at work what would I do and again this hasn't in practice right. I'm really in that position but in my head I, I have these anxieties around it and mm -hmm. I'm so realizing how much of these things have been internalized that if you make friends with your co-workers or if you actually care about them then your business will it's just deemed to be um you know unsuccessful at some mm -hmm. place yeah I think you know like I I I think that you have like valid feelings there because I think a, a lot of workplace friendships in a different context, like can um, in bigger businesses and stuff like that, can be really messed up and really toxic and all of that, right? Um, and at the same time, and I've had those same you know fears too because I'm like you know I remember one I think it was a Sunday I wanted to call you and then I was like oh I don't know if I should call we didn't talk about boundaries you know maybe it's like 
when Friday comes, that's it. And I'll talk to you on Monday, which is a totally fine boundary, but I didn't know it. So then and that's what made me think. And I was like, oh, maybe we should talk about this, you know, um, talk about like what could be good because it, 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 it to me, it is about still really pushing and challenging those things. You know, it's like a lot of times uh, when it comes to, I guess, profit or anything, it's like you fuck the relationships and go forward. Um, and we've been so fr afraid of it because in those structures, I think the, because there's competition and because there's, you know, um, other things at play, I think it, 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 that's an environment that's like a petri dish for tox toxicity, right? And so here, I think um, there is no petri dish of toxicity. I think that um, there's, um, I think that we have a good foundation because of the work that we do and because of that we are constantly talking about relationship building and connection is uh, so key, it's so key to a lot of things. Um, so yeah, it is scary, but I think um, um, I think in this context, in this small context, uh, it feels pretty nice and safe to test that, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like I really, so like when I was a teacher, I had like work friends, but like, I feel like a lot of the times like work friends would like entail like unsolicited advice like crossing those boundaries that I had established and that type of thing so I feel like the fact that we like try to put thought into are we crossing people's boundaries like what kind of boundaries do people have and that type of thing is really valuable and I feel like will help with sustainability overall too okay who's next Reva? yeah I can go I need to share my screen though. So I think I need to have either like host. Okay. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So I am doing workplace accountability, which is, was going to be part of my um, presentation last time, but we didn't end up having time. So it ended up being this time and I added a couple of more details about it. So, what happens when you don't have accountability in the workplace, right? So it can damage the team because people are not sure about priorities. People are not sure about, so that like goes into the next one, unclear priorities. People are just not sure about what they're supposed to be doing. And because of that, like, what am I trying to say? Like people, if people don't know what they're supposed to be doing, then like there's always that anxiety like in certain work situations that I have had like I have had people who have not told me what I'm supposed to do and so I'm just anxious that I'm doing the wrong thing a lot of the time so yeah and then less engaged employees because if there's no accountability people don't feel an obligation or have the motivation to go above and beyond or even like meet the requirements of the job and then there's less reaching of goals because there might not have been goals set in the first place. And also everyone has unclear priorities. So everyone's on a different page. And so it's just like, doesn't work. And then also it like can have lower levels of trust because if you are so scared to speak out about something and you feel like you'll be like reprimanded or you won't be heard if you say something, then you're just not gonna say it, but it's gonna stay and it's gonna continue to fester. And there's also high turnover because of all of these reasons, right? No one wants to be in a workplace that causes their mental health to decline. So how do we have workplace accountability? So one of the big things that I found when I was researching this was like, just to be prepared, right? So like kind of like where we were saying with like the workplace friendships about like making sure to respect time boundaries. Like this is just like a time boundary and like a preparation boundary. Like if we have a meeting, making sure that I do my part of what I needed to do before the meeting. So first of all, the meeting goes smoothly and yeah. And then also feedback, right? And feedback, like they said a lot of stuff about feedback about how it should be free from biases. It should be delivered respectfully. It should be caring, personal, and clear and direct. And you shouldn't procrastinate that feedback because you're scared of what the person will think. And also it is 
owning up to your mistakes and having that space to be able to do so without feeling like you're going to be fired. It's also giving genuine apologies. Giving genuine apologies is something everyone should be trained on because I just feel like it's not something that's modeled a lot in schools or even like in like when you're little, like no one told me how to make an apology. So I feel like that's something that is important to know as well. Goal setting is another thing. So just like having team goals, having individual goals and having frequent check-ins about these goals, like kind of how Aredvi and Ignacio like check in with me to make sure like, how is everything going with the job? How do you like what you're doing? Is there something else you would like to be doing? And having very clear and concise expectations that are explicitly stated and not assumed. So like, you don't have to worry about not doing what you're supposed to be doing because you already know what you're supposed to be doing. Then there's also just making sure everyone has everything that they need for their job. So like, if someone needs to use a certain program, making sure they have accessibility to that program so that they can do the work that they need to do. And then there was a certain part of what I researched that talked a lot about building an environment of trust and how a lot of the times in the workplace, like in a traditional workplace, they use fear-based motivation, which actually causes less accountability because of the fear of making mistakes, right? In an environment that feels like you can like come with problems and that you have like that trust, so you will be able to make a mistake and be okay with saying, okay, I made this mistake. And I like how it's kind of like broken down, like this website broke it down into intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, right? So intrinsic for those who don't know, like is like more of like the motivation that comes from within it. So it's doing things because you're excited about them versus extrinsic is motivation from the outside, like money basically. So in the article that I read, it kind of said to find a balance between these two things. But I think that at least at HEAL, a lot of the work we do can be intrinsically based because if we're excited about it, it's more fun to do. And also like, even though there are some things we have to do, I feel like a lot of the things that I do with this job like is stuff that I'm excited about and I appreciate that. And so why does it matter, right? Especially in reference to the workplace. So first of all, it boosts trust and allows for deeper relationships. It can also improve performance and increase the meeting of goals, and it allows for learning. So these are just some questions to ponder that I found or like that I made up about like different categories. So like with prioritizing, if you're in a job where you're not sure about what needs to be prioritized, maybe asking yourself or the people you work with, like, do you want more or less direction with your work? Do you need help making the short term or long term goals? And how do you feel about check-ins regarding these goals? And then with feedback, I feel like, especially with feedback, like you have, like, it's good to know what kind of feedback people like and like being very explicit about type of feedback you want. So like, how do you feel about feedback? What kind of feedback is helpful for you? And then building trust. So like this also just goes into what Ignacio said too, right? Like how we can improve trust in our team. What type of community building exercises would make you feel more comfortable? Do you appreciate check-ins at the beginning of meetings? Like different things that you can do to make your workplace more accountable. And yeah, so that was, I think, all I had. Um, um, uh, when you were talking about the accountability um, that, that, um, that a lot of the motivation and stuff like that is like fear-based, um, that just again makes me think about like how much stuff is is you know uh, you know drenched in fear yeah. as a is as a motivator or something like just to I'm totally terrified that you know I'm gonna mess up that I'm gonna get fired that I'm not gonna be the best that I'm not whatever um, and anything that's led with fear is like it just doesn't work it doesn't no. work um, and as we talk about this like anything with fear or shame so. And, and when you were talking about the, the, you know, prioritizing and things like that, that just, that's like, um, you know, the communication piece, that's like learning how to communicate with one another, like how, how you talk and how other people, you know, um, talk back, that back and forth, like what works. So, yeah, yeah that, 
fits in. I'm sure. I'm sure yours is going to too, right, already. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, the things that stood out for me uh, was one around the, I really like the question around, you know, needing short-term and long-term direction and kind of having conversations around that and do we want more or less directions um, in the work? And I, I don't know, I feel like we have generally done that, but I don't know if it's explicitly like tackle that in, in that form. So that was really interesting for me. I would love to incorporate that into our check-ins and retreats. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is it the short-term and long-term? Um, besides, I, I, we did it in a retreat, but I would love to have it as more of an active conversation. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece um, around offering a genuine apology, I was thinking about how, because of the hierarchies of the workplace, again, capitalist model, apologies are meant to go be one-sided. So like if you're lower on the hierarchy, you're supposed to be apologizing to the higher. And I personally don't have a problem with hierarchy um, at the workplace or in general in life, in relationships. I think hierarchies are na kind of natural to have, right? But I don't like them to be uh, determining of, of make dynamics unhealthy i don't like because of the hierarchy right so uh you know for example ignacio because of all of your experience and the work that you've done like of course i see you as like holding a higher position than myself but at the same time i do expect you to be able to offer an apology the same way that i i am expected to offer an apology if either of us make a mistake yeah. um and I don't think, again, going to the capitalist model, I don't think that is an expectation that can be set in a lot of workplaces mm -hmm. around hierarchies, right? Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good point. That's a very good point. Yes, indeed, that's true. Because the, the the apologies are very like, yeah, and, and also half the time, not genuine, right? right. It's not really yeah. genuine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because like you said, like it's based on fear. So you're apologizing yeah. to keep your job, not because you yeah. actually feel bad for what you did. Exactly. Right, which which brings to the question again. This is like the larger concept of power and consent, and how do we like at the workplace when your job, which often in the capitalist model, depend your survival depends on. Like that's the first problem. Your mm -hmm. survival shouldn't depend on the money you get from your job. Your very basic survival. So you already put people in that position, and then you want them to have good relationships at the workplace within this hierarchy. <laughs> that is just like paradoxical you know you can't have that um so it's either or like ideal again i don't i don't know what the i would like to envision what would be like and of course would love to do that with you all mm -hmm. but like the reality of the situation where somebody makes decisions about who gets fired and hired and that person has a lot of power yeah and that's going to impact the power dynamics of the relationships that are built mm -hmm. at the but just friendships we're good friendships just yeah everyday stuff so yeah. i don't I, I didn't have any fancy slides like you all um, <laughs> in fact my entire computer system and technology and everything my devices are really in bad shape right now so i'm just gonna look at my notes and, look at the <laughs> and <laughs> present <laughs> um so my uh, topic is slow work or as uh, I would like to see it uh, be more popular, the slow work movement. I would love that to happen. Um, and so slow work, it's kind of like a word play or, or a um, branch of the slow food movement, which kind of then expanded. And in case you're not familiar with the slow food movement, uh, it has an interesting history that it started in the 1980s, like 1986 in Rome, after McDonald's uh, was opened there. And then, you know, the idea of fast food came and there was this movement that got was started there, like it's slow food. Uh, and the idea was that, you know, we're going to fast food requires the exploitation of so many people for you to be able to, like, go somewhere and get that fast food. And also, like, you don't get to experience the joy of what it really takes to prepare good food. 
you can't really prepare good food slowly, very fast. You have to do it slowly and you're going to enjoy the process. So that was kind of like philosophy, which is like, I love this because from the very beginning, it's so anti-capitalistic, this slow food movement. And then from there, it kind of grew into like different uh, branches of like it's slow living, it's slow, um, you know, like, like doing the slow economy, just doing things like the whole going against the idea that we have to always be growing and getting bigger and doing things faster and be more productive and more efficient. Just like a slow the fuck down, everyone. You know, like it's okay. Like <laughs> we're not we're not robots who are supposed to have like higher processing power, as you know, every every time, uh, or like evolving that way. Uh, so anyway, so that was, you know, that's become, it's become kind of a lifestyle now. So that's where this slow work philosophy comes from. And this definition I found says it is about moving through life more consciously, taking the time for the little pleasures of everyday life and dealing with mind and body uh, spiritually. Um, so again, that goes against, I think, everything I've ever heard about what work is supposed to be about. Um, <laughs> and then... Um, some of the misconceptions about what slow work is, of course, um, uh, will come up is that, you know, slow work is for slackers, people who are just lazy and they don't want to do the work or people who don't have ambition, uh, unreliable workers who just want to be late to work, you know, not really put their 100% in or just people who are just untalented, you know, they don't get it. So they come up with this slow work thing to get out of work, um, which Personally, I don't believe in laziness. I don't believe, I think humans are naturally wanting to work and be productive. It's just the conditions that they are given to work within are so discouraging that just causes mental health problems and discouragement. Um, and also like, interestingly, some of the things that I came across in like the conversations in the slow, slow work movement is how the nine to five is so arbitrary. The whole eight hour like work day is so arbitrary, it's supposed to be an improvement like the 40 hour week from the hundred hour week. Um, so like we just landed here. Um, and I, I truly, if he, the human race lives long enough, I hope one day we look at these days as like the absurdity of the 40 hour week that you know we made people work 40 hours uh, just to survive. Uh, but most people actually are most productive either early morning hours or late uh, night hours. Um, and having that flexibility around it, most people are more productive when they work less hours a day as opposed to more hours a day. So all, these are all of the things that the slow work movement focuses on. It turns out that when you actually do slow work, you're more productive overall, you produce more stuff. Uh, but there is always that fear of like, oh, no, if I don't have you sitting at a desk for like 10 hours a day, I'm losing money. It's kind of, you know, contradictory to that. Um, so here's some strategies for what are some of the things we could do to kind of incorporate the slow work into our uh, work style. Um, so basically, like instead of worrying about checking off, doing as many things as possible, um, we can prioritize what is the most important thing to be done each day and accept that some things are just never going to get done, but you are getting the most important things done within your capacity. And that's that's good. Um, the other thing is the idea of time blocking. So for some of the things that are like routine tasks, uh, instead of just like always doing it, these are like checking emails, social media, you know, whatever your routine tasks in the job are, instead of just co co constantly doing them, you can set aside, be like, I'm going to be doing like emails for an hour, set a timer, do emails for that hour. And then actually when the hour is done, be done with emails for that day, right? And then move on from them and accept that again, emails can wait, some things can wait. Um, and then the other understanding that preventing stress is a lot better than handling stress. So setting aside the strategies for how to just not even have a stressful situation uh, to begin with can be really good for like having that sustainable, slow pace of work. Um, then this is a conversation we've had a lot is around prioritizing well-being and quality over quantity. Um, so, you know, accepting that the well-being of the people is always more important than the well-being of the business. Um, in fact, if the well-being of the business has to come at the expense of well-being of the people, then it might it, it shall fail. That's you know that should be the natural course of things. Um, the other thing is getting quality rest, good quality rest. 
right? I've learned that like recently some companies, some big companies, I hear Google or maybe some other like big companies, they've started actually incentivizing napping at work or even um, like giving other incentives to their workers to get more sleep. Even if it's just like they do, they don't have to come to work or something because they they are learning that workers who sleep more they are doing much better work than those who don't. Which is like it's fucked up, of course. Like Google is very self interested. Like they're not. It's not like they're, they're interested in the well being. They're interested in getting more work and more productivity out of their workers. But in general, it's like it makes sense. If you take care of your people, they take care of you. Like it's you know common sense. Um, then this one I really like is like really mindful of scheduling only a few days each day and really only one important thing a day and pacing things out, uh, saying no to things and not overwhelming ourselves, um, you know, around doing too many things at once. Because again, we can do better with less. Um, the another one is taking a lot of total breaks from work instead of having work. And this is something I know Ignacia, you and I, <laughs> And it's difficult because we love the work we do. We're always thinking about it, but like allowing a space to take actual total breaks from work and having that like this is I'm just going to do something that has nothing to do with work. Which for us sometimes it means not even watching TV because not watching media, not having conversations with people, just completely unplugging from devices because of the nature of the work we do. Is anytime I'm interacting with the larger society, I'm like thinking about okay. This is how this is all related. Um, all right, and then we have setting up routines that can encourage um, our well-being. Uh, so this is like meditation, eating well, like working on those things. And then this one I really like the idea of monotasking instead of multitasking. Multitasking never works. There've been a lot of studies done on this. Multitasking, no, if anybody tells you they're a good multitasker, or if they tell you they can really thrive on six hours of sleep a night, they are most likely lying. Like maybe they're part of the one person who, who can actually do it, but they're probably are just convincing themselves that that's what they're good at. They're not, multitasking doesn't work for anybody. And basically the whole idea is that, you know, bringing peace to work, no rush, no stress, and having work be a source of um, good energy as opposed to something that you dread and um, kind of sucks energy out of you. Again, something that honestly, Having been at a lot of workplaces, I feel like I'm, I feel so wonderful that we get to create this kind of environment here. But I'm also really aware that it is very um, unusual to even have these conversations or these kind of intentions in place. Um, yeah, and so the kind of question I like at the end, I'm, I've been thinking about is like, how does slow work align with our values at the Hill Project? And um, how, you know, how can we be more conscious as we work again? You know, with all these conversations that we just had today, how we work and how we can incorporate more of this into our practices um, as working professionals. Thank you. You know, I, I think that we are, we're there, we're getting, you know, like we have, we have implemented some things, you know. Um, so for instance, um, you know, when, when people want to collaborate with us and say, you know, like, you know, this is happening in a week, or in a couple of days, you know, uh, that I remember saying, I cannot deal with things that are fast. I can't, I have so much anxiety around it. When it's like, it has to happen right now. I just, I'm like, it's a no then. It's an absolute no, because I, I don't want to rush. I don't want to have an anxiety. I don't want to make a mistake. Um, and it feels a lot of times, um, depending on what it is, it feels um, too business-like to me, you know, like, and so in, in the worst ways, I mean, you know, and so fast talking to me is funny because I always talk about fast movers and fast talkers in a way that um, it reminds me a lot of, um, you know, uh, what is it, car salesmen, lawyers, and, uh, you know, um, people who are grooming because my groomer when I was a kid was like that fast talking confuses you that confusion and stuff. It, it, um, so I think that we have implemented that in some of the things that we are doing, but I think that we can do more. Um, I love the slow uh, movement uh, because I am doing that in my personal life, you know, slow moving, like really being intentional about things. It's a definitely a different life that I have now than I had several years ago. So I'm all for 
this and thinking about how we can implement even more uh, of this. Yeah, this is really cool. I hadn't actually heard of the slow work movement, but like, I feel like we have like implemented a lot of this stuff, like just like the fact that like we have such a flexible schedule and like being able to do work when we want to do it versus like having, I mean, we have meetings obviously, but like the work that is around the meetings is when we can do it. So like, I feel like that's helpful. And like you said something about how like one of the misconceptions of slow work is like not putting a hundred percent, but like in reality, no one can put a fucking hundred percent, like no one, it's not possible. And I just feel like it's this expectation that like work has um, with like, you have to put like your all, but it's like, no one can put their all or like, they're just going to be exhausted. And I feel like the thing you said about breaks is something I've honestly tried to implement a lot, like working for 45 minutes and then having a 15 minute break where I just like go away from my phone and everything else I have. And then just like coming back has really helped me overall. And yeah, I think it'd be really cool if we could do like the um, prioritize one thing a day, like if we could like share it with each other, like be like, okay, this is what I'm going to prioritize. Like if anything else doesn't get done, it doesn't get done, but this is the one thing I'm gonna prioritize. So that I feel like that'll, at least for me, when I have a priority, it's like easier for me to get to rather than having like a huge list of things yeah. that I need to do, so. Yeah. yeah, and it also uh, creates accountability too. As exactly. you say, this is what we're gonna do. So it's really cool. I like this, and you um, it made me think too about um, uh, you know how you said when you get more more work um more rest, you actually are more productive. Yeah. Um, and I say yes, that is so true. And especially as a person who, you know, um, writes, you know, like or or is a per, like a performer or an artist type person, you know, like you know that you need time for the process. People joke about it. It's like, you know, this is my process. I have to think. And really, you know, it's about thinking. I, I always say one of my favorite things to do is, you know, contemplating life. I think, I think a lot, right? And so that's time. That's like time to actually think, not when you're like, ah, I have so many things to do. So I think that uh, the slow, you know, work movement, it, 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 uh, it helps that creative process. It allows for a creative process to happen. And, um, and I, I definitely have um, incorporated saying no more than I have ever said no in my life. And I love the quote where you said, some things can wait. I feel like writing that up somewhere. Some things can wait. And that's true. <laughs> it can. It doesn't have to. Or I have to say that to myself as a person who has anxiety disorder. When I'm getting, when I'm getting into my anxiety mode, at some point, you know, I stop and I'm like, is this necessary? Is this an emergency? And then it's like always no. So I'm like, then stop it, you know, just stop. <laughs> so it's like asking those questions. And I think what's that? Um, it's a, a grid, right? That's uh, it's like Maslow's or something where you. Yeah, that like um, what is um, urgent, most important, what can wait, like, like kind of categorizing um, things so that you're not putting everything in one, you know, bang. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's. Um, I had a lot of thoughts that I just escaped me. Um, we, definitely for the anxiety stuff. I feel like I'm that way, and I have to remind myself a lot that things can wait. And really, I mean, really, I'm. I, you know, when I'm not anxious, I'm like, just about everything can wait. Everything can wait. Like, you know, <laughs> uh, really, nothing is that important and urgent. Yeah. um and you know like we're not first responders or anything like we're right, not right. it's not like if you don't get something done somebody's gonna like die um <laughs> and i mean you know in the in the immediate sense um so that's really good to remind myself in general um and also like around productivity i yeah it, it's kind of tricky because sometimes i find myself especially during like our peak seasons i find um myself in like having overworking and then building this internal resentment it's not like pressure coming from anyone internal resentment around how much I haven't had time to take care of myself and doing the things that make me feel good mm -hmm. and kind of it's a spiral then you know I don't take care of myself work more so I don't feel good so I don't want to take care of myself and then it just like <laughs> keeps, yeah. keeps going down that um and trying to slowly get better at 
really again saying no to things uh which is really tricky then again because you know we all three of us our survival depends on this job mm -hmm. um so like that is a reality that when you have to live with it there is like a certain level of like how much wiggle room you have as well is this urgent or not how much right. how many things i can like at, at what points do i um you know make those decisions so always i feel like in my head going through those um those questions but i feel like there's a good structure that we have developed and a good foundation and i really like the idea of announcing our priorities every day um and i think we kind of do that sometimes like just let mm -hmm. try to work on today and it's like oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well we did it this was wonderful i really uh, enjoyed all the conversation yeah oh and I would say to you, Aretvi, then um, in, in the thing that you just talked about, um, um, overworking in those times where, you know, it's so then let's all talk about what can I do? What can Rilla do? What can we do together so that we can help you not do that? And so maybe it's something that we can do that could alleviate that or we can brainstorm to do something else. But um, I don't want you to feel like that. And I don't want you to have to feel like, you know, uh, stressed you know so let's let's think about that together yeah thank you yeah i appreciate mm -hmm. it likewise um you know i know those times are not just hard or stressful for me so i would love to figure out a way we can all mm -hmm. each yeah uh, yeah that would be great go team <laughs>